Welcome to Sarder TV. I'm Tracy Fitzpatrick. Our studio guest is Mark Johnson, co-founder and senior partner at InnoSight, a consulting firm that strategizes across a plethora of industries, from healthcare to defense. He's also a prolific author and is here to discuss his latest book, Reinvent Your Business Model. Mark, thanks for stopping by. Uh, it's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Let me start with the name, the title of your book. It's a bit lengthy. It's actually called Reinvent Your Business Model, How to Seize the White Space for Transformative Growth. Tell us what you're referring to uh, when you are discussing white space. What is this all about? So the white space is uh, a company's area where it requires to achieve new growth. It requires not only coming up with a new value proposition for a customer, serving a customer in a whole new way, whether that's a brand new customer or an existing customer, but also requires changing the business model, changing the operating model, the profit formula, what we'll talk about. Those areas are white space, as opposed to adjacencies where you serve new customers in new geographies, but you can leverage your existing operating model, your overall business model. So who should be reading your book? It's really the gamut. Uh, company executives who are facing growth gap challenges, uh, innovation folks who are trying to look to try to incubate and develop new business opportunities, strategists who are thinking about how do they go beyond the core, how do they fill growth gaps. I would say management levels that cut across from the very top to individual groups of strategists, marketing folks, innovation folks that really need to think about how do they get growth that's not just about the core. I would also say in terms of industry, the challenge of disruption, the challenge of being uh, facing transformation cuts across all kinds of industries. Virtually no industry is immune. And because of that, the ability to really think about addressing transformation, continuing to address growth requires having the full spectrum of innovation including business model innovation and how to, to leverage it. And, and so really, executives in Fortune 500 companies, Fortune 1000 companies across all industries. What inspired you to write this particular type of business book at this time, and what makes you stand out from the crowded field? Well, so first off, uh, the reason I wrote this book is when I started Innosight with Clay Christensen 20 years ago in 2000, we all focused on how do we help companies create new growth through this idea of disruptive innovation, coming in with uh, products and services that were cheaper, more convenient. It could start with a market that was less demanding and work up. We realized, though, the, the real challenge in being able to develop those opportunities or stave off a threat of disruption wasn't just about, well, can we come up with this new product or service? The real challenge was in changing the business model. And so we realized we needed to build a common language, a common way to think about businesses and business models. That was the genesis of starting this whole work back in the early 2000s about what is a business model, what's business model innovation. What I think makes this book different from other books that are related or direct, either re directly related or indirectly related to business model innovation is that this focuses very much on trying to understand not just the what but the how. How exactly would you incubate and develop, accelerate a business model and a business model innovation effort and really get to the prescriptive piece in the context of a managerial setting where company executives are dealing with the day-to-day, -day, um, not just having the opportunity, the, the, the privilege of being able to create new business models. So what do you hope uh, business executives learn or take away from this book? Well, I think one is that there is an approach, that there is a, a method, a step-by-step, -step, if you will, on how you can develop a process of business model innovation. Second, I think it's very important to understand the incumbent challenge that comes with trying to create a new business model when an existing business model already exists within any successful established organization. So I hope that they'll understand, one, that they need to think about the right process, both strategically as well as, if you will, innovation-wise, to incubate and develop a new business model. Second, that they understand the organizational and behavioral challenges that come with really trying to incubate and develop a new business model. 
What prevents already successful companies from embracing new growth and transformational opportunities? And can you share a case study with us about this? Sure. Well, it, it really comes down to the, the success becomes the, 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 the ability to be successful becomes the disability when it comes to trying to create a new business model. Every successful existing business is operating by a successful business model. That's been honed over many, many years. Processes have been refined, the rules and norms of the organization, the way it makes money, the exact way that it serves a customer. All these things have been developed and refined and honed. And that becomes the, if you will, orthodoxy that gets in the way of being able to develop new business models. The old actually gets in the way of the new. And so it's very hard for these companies to get out of their own way. A great case example would be Research in Motion, a Canadian company that develops the Blackberry. Our old Blackberries. The old yeah. Blackberries. <laughs> They've been around a long time and they were very, very successful in their time. When they came out in 1999, you know, they were the greatest thing because you could then have email on the go and they developed into a consumer product. They just dominated the business market. And then all of a sudden, Apple comes along with its iPhone and completely changed the paradigm. It was not just about being a, you know, a phone. It was really a platform for developing all the applications that sit on an Apple iPhone, which was completely different than what BlackBerry offered. And BlackBerry was spending all of its time developing, refining, extending what it knew as its success. But when Apple came along, it required them to do something completely new and different, and it was caught flat-footed. It had spent so much time focused on its core that it could never really look beyond. So they weren't taking advantage of their white spaces. They just kind of ignored what was happening and just say too focused, you think, on what their existing right. product they was. They either ignored it or to, to the sort of the results of what the case study said, they, they said part of the problem was they used the quote, how do you change the engine? when you're flying at 200 kilometers an hour. They felt like they were riding this great wave, this, this great machine called the BlackBerry, and if they took their eyes off that, they felt like that business could go, go away. It, in fact, did mostly go away because of Apple, but at the time, they felt like they could continue to make improvements and compete against Apple, and it just became a long-term downward spiral. Tell us about the term business model innovation that you discuss, discuss at great length in the book, and can you share an example of a company that has successfully embraced this particular philosophy? Yeah, absolutely. So business model innovation, by definition, means that you are not only changing a product or service, of, which you could translate to giving new value to a customer, but you're also changing internally the way the company captures value for itself, meaning it makes its money in a completely different way. Maybe it has a much lower margin to it, but it has much higher volume of product. Or it can create a much lower overhead structure to afford having lower gross margins. So it's changing the balance sheet and the income statement of the company along with the proposition to a customer as well. And then final piece is you're also changing in a major way the resources and processes, the operating model of the company and the way it delivers on these products or services. And so when you put that all together, that's business model innovation. And it's not incremental, it's you know, you can get in a semantics discussion about, well, you know, we improved our product development function. So isn't that business model innovation? Well, I mean, you certainly are improving an existing business model, business model, but business model innovation is really a major point of departure from the existing way that a company creates and captures and delivers value. And I think a great example, um, a little known example, but a really compelling one is Dow Corning, who is a, deliver a producer manufacturer of silicon for businesses. Um, and they basically had a, a business model that said, we're going to sell silicone through a sales force, a very highly technical sales force. We're going to continue to innovate our products because we always want to make the cutting edge types of silicone. 
And so they had a very big R&D organization. They had a very strong technical sales force. But they had a set of customers who said, we don't need all of that fancy uh, engineering and sales. We know how to use silicone. We just want it as the cheapest price we can get and just have it in one kind of uh, delivery volume. We don't need all the different kinds of, if you will, SKUs. So long story short is what Dow Corning basically did is leveraged e-commerce and digital and put their whole sales delivery on the internet and enabled business customers to actually order silicone through the internet in a very rules-based way. It completely changed the nature of how the uh, customer procured the silicone and how it was delivered to them, which allowed them to have it at a much lower price for the customer, but also the company, Dow Corning, was able to still maintain margins because it was able to get its cost structure down. That was a fundamental business model innovation. And in fact, it was so different that they separated it out and they called it Ziameter by Dow Corning because it was actually disruptive to the main organization and the way they delivered to these customers. And they're still doing that today. And they're still, still doing working. it today. They, they do the high end as well, or and they, they just got rid of that completely? They do the high end as well, and they've said what this has done is it's created much better market segmentation so that customers better understand what kind of value proposition they really need, so they can give much more targeted uh, value proposition for their customers by having both Dow Corning and Ziameter by Dow Corning. So what are the four key elements needed to create a successful business model? So the four key elements are first a customer value proposition which has two parts of itself. Uh, one is what is the fundamental job or need a customer is trying to get done. It needs to be important, it needs to be unsatisfied if you have an opportunity to serve that. So what's the job? The need. The second is what's the product or service that can address that job and how might we sell it through the right kind of distribution and then what's the right way that we price it um, in terms of do we directly sell it for a single price or do we sell it over a subscription model so forth. That creates value for the customer both by the product service the way it's sold and how it's sold. That's called a customer value proposition. That's how you create value. That's the first part. The second part is how you capture value for the company, and as I mentioned earlier, that's the income statement and the profit for in the balance sheet. How does the company manage the ability to create profit and how fast it drives product through its system? That all relates to a way of value capture for the company, financial value capture. There's also a mission component too, especially for nonprofits and how it captures the mission for the company. And then the third piece is divided into resources and processes. These are the activities, the way the work gets done. The resources and processes enable delivery repeatably of the value proposition to a customer and repeatably how the company captures that value through the income statement, how it makes money on this repeatable basis. And can you share a case study uh, of a new company that's been able to transform an existing market by leveraging their white space? Yeah, so a great example of this um, that came in by storm is IKEA. Mm -hmm. So IKEA is the discount, um, quote unquote, discount furniture retailer uh, that has never been replicated in the retail, in the furniture retail space. They came in with a whole different kind of value proposition for a customer. They basically said, there are a set of customers out there, a big set, who really are saying, look, I just need disposable furniture that looks good. You know, we're a new couple, we just got married, we don't have any money, but we'd like to outfit our apartment with nice looking furniture. So what IKEA came up with is the whole idea of that we can have good looking furniture, you'll have to put it together as the consumer. Um, we'll make it very appealing for you because we'll have really nice showrooms, we'll have babysitting services for young families, we'll have entertainment, we'll have food, so we'll make this really great experience for you shopping. Then when it comes time to buy your furniture, you'll buy it in flat boxes that you can put on your van or in a pickup truck that will ship out of our warehouse to you, or you'll back up your car to our warehousing facility 
and then you will bring it home and you will put it together. And this piece of furniture that you put together won't probably last more than five years or so. But overall, you're going to get very affordable furniture with a pleasurable experience that uh, allows you to outfit your entire apartment. And the way that they put together the resources and processes, a different value proposition for the customer, and then ultimately how they manage their whole cost structure was a fundamental business model change. It was the white space for the industry. And as such, we haven't seen any other real furniture retailer replicate IKEA so in the same way. So they haven't really to this day. And it's to this around. day, not at the extent that IKEA does what it does. And, it sta and IKEA has stuck very closely to its business model and has continued to expand around the world and continue to drive real value. What are the top three things that contribute to tectonic shifts in industries and what should they do to adapt to these unforeseeable disruptions? Well, there are three major shifts that can happen um, in any company and in any industry. The customer and the market can change the conditions of the consumer demand. Some of that happens naturally, you know, over time. Customers are used to products that provide performance and reliability, but over time they want things more customized, more convenient, and then even more over time they want things to be cheaper and lower cost. So there's a continued evolution of the nature of how customers, what they want and demand in their market, we call that the product life cycle. Sometimes it can be more dramatic than that because of circumstances in the market. Um, but typically that follows these kinds of changes. So that's one. The second is technology, and we know that in spades, you know, with uh, digital, uh, digital transformation, uh, other kinds of technology, 3D printing, um, Internet of Things, all these things of technology can enable new business models and create industry change in a fundamental way. And then the third is regulatory, that uh, major regulatory changes can actually cause uh, shifts in the industry and how things are done. Let's talk about a company like Amazon that continues always to push into its white spaces and seems to be able to successfully constantly transform itself. So why uh, aren't other companies following suit? Well, it's a great question. I don't fully have the answer as to why other companies are following suit. I think part of the answer is, again, what we talked before about is companies are way too uh, beholden to their existing ways of doing business, their existing business model. That business model gets honed over years. Managers come in, they have a very short-term horizon, both in terms of the way Wall Street and investors and the investment community works, but also oftentimes the way rewards and incentives work to keep them in somewhat of a short-term horizon. I think that's partly to do with it. Another aspect that is key about Amazon, led by Jeff Bezos, who's a visionary and is the founder and has a long-term horizon, but he also has a relentless focus on the customer, the consumer, and really deeply understanding what exactly they're trying to get done, and is willing to go into places that he thinks consumers jobs or needs are unmet and then is willing to change not just what he provides in terms of a service uh, but also the business model behind it um, and has that ability to make those moves. I think other companies have not been as relentlessly focused, um, almost um, obsessively focused on the consumer the way Jeff Bezos is uh, to the point where they're willing to make the changes not just in product, but in how they organize to be able to do that. And so because of both existing uh, orthodoxies of the business model, as well as not enough focus on the consumer, I think they are slow to do what Jeff Bezos does at Amazon. So you think it's easier for startups to transform their white space because they're not so entrenched and have all of this baggage behind them? It is, although, uh, Bezos, of course, at Amazon is no longer a startup. So that is, that is partly true that it's easier for a startup in the sense that they don't have the baggage. What's harder for a startup is they don't have the access to resources, uh, to skills, to competencies, to capabilities that have been built over years that become, if you will, the feedstock for along with technology for creating new business models. 
So for as much as large companies are behind small companies, they also are, they have an advantage that they can take this raw stock of people and technology and actually enable new business models if they could have the right mindset like a Jeff Bezos. So how have new digital technologies helped companies like Netflix, Microsoft transform their business models? Well, so when you think about uh, Microsoft, Microsoft spent a lot of time in the 2000s playing catch up. Um, they made a lot of mistakes. They were beholden to their operating system. But their new, new CEO, who before becoming the CEO was uh, responsible for cloud computing, he became the CEO and he further took all the initiatives around Microsoft and said, we are going on the cloud. We're going to spend more time thinking about businesses that need to go on the cloud, which was a move away from consumer. They were mostly a consumer company. They may became much more of a business oriented company. They did a lot more on mobile platforms, um, not just on the PC and they created a subscription model. So they used digital, vis-a-vis -vis the cloud, vis-a-vis -vis mobile computing, and, and what that allowed for that networked type of environment to transform the company. And as, as such, they've been on a tear and have had a whole new uh, level of value creation that they weren't enjoying a decade ago. Okay, here's the startup we want to talk about, Threadless. Uh -huh. So tell us how they built their unique business model and while doing this, they also gave their customers control of the company as it was growing. Tell well, so this is, this is an example and it kind of ties to the day that we're in the digital world and the internet of crowdsourcing. So along with this idea of Jeff Bezos of being relentlessly focused on the consumer, Threadless has taken um, their passion to the consumer and said, you help decide what kinds of t-shirt uh, apparel products we should uh, design. Um, give us the designs, what you find most compelling, helping them, of course, with some structure to help develop these designs, and help us to understand what it should look like. And then we will have a process to be able to quickly develop product that stays connected to the consumer and the fashion needs that they have. And as a consequence, they're never um, creating excess inventory because there's not as much demand as they thought because they always have a handle on the demand the consumer wants. So how will organizations know when it's time to let go or alter their core businesses and how can dual transformation help them achieve all of these new initiatives that they will have to undertake? Sure. Well, I think first, uh, companies need to understand when their core business is running out of steam or it's beginning to start to slow down to a level of which no matter what kind of further investment you put in, there's just no, long what we would call, no longer what we would call innovation headroom, that their level of investment is not going to pay off in terms of continued growth. We call this a growth gap. So if they can look out in the future and say, you know, we aspire to be, say, a $10 billion company. If we honestly look at our core and the markets that we serve in that core, we can only get to $7 billion, um, and that's insufficient growth for what we're trying to achieve. We have a $3 billion growth gap. They can start to talk about, well, how do they fill that gap? They're going to have to do things beyond the core. And the question is, as they go beyond the core to new geographies, to new customers, are they going to have to change their business model along with changing to serve new customers? And that's, that's a, something that has to be developed over time. But it's first looking at what are the signs, the early signs looking out five to ten years that their business is not going to be able to sustain the growth or at least the aspirational growth that they're trying to achieve and then look at what can they do to fill that growth by being be able to go beyond the core and that's when they'll either have to deal with adjacency moves where they can go into new places with their existing business model or into new white space areas where they actually have to come up with new business models. Once they have that in place, then I think they can think through how do they set in place the right kind of structure and the right set of incentives to en enable new business model development and other types of initiatives to take place. 
So what are the three stages that need to be implemented when uh, trying to create realistic business model blueprints? Well, I, I think it's important to think about how do business model innovations, successful ones, ultimately develop. And I think there are two important things to think about. One is any successful business model um, that comes about from a startup because you know they start really from nothing and they ultimately become something, have changed the fundamental way that business model works four times before they get it right. That's one. Two is there's a professor at UC Berkeley, Steve Blank, who said that a startup is not a business. A startup is an organization in search of a viable business model. So that really lays out the premise of business model innovation, which is it's really a test and learn empirical. We have to go and develop in different ways to ultimately find what is the right business model. You cannot in advance design it. And as such, you have to go through three major steps. The first is an incubation phase where you're in that process to actually decide, discover what is a viable business model by going in market, in a foothold market, and actually testing and learning through working with customers in what we would call transactional learning, where they're actually paying, and making it happen. Once you get to a point when you understand how this business model works, that you've made the adjustments to serve the customer in the way that's appropriate, then you can accelerate phase two, which means you're basically scaling and you just have to manage the rate at which you scale so that you don't lose control. And then the third major phase is then, if you're an established company, is deciding this accelerating new business and business model, which by definition means it's now successful, does it reside in an existing operating company or should it be its own separate unit? Again, for the reasons that maybe it really makes money in a totally different way with lower margins that are not going to be uh, consistent with the existing uh, operating companies that already exist. That's what we call the transition phase. And so you have to go through those three phases, especially as an established corporation, if you're going to be successful in business model development. Are there any rock star companies out there as far as business model developments that people kind of look up to and say, oh my God, that, that, what an idea. They're innovators. Well, to be honest, the only rock star business model innovator company uh, is Amazon. Uh, and, and if you want to call it a serial business model innovator, they've gone through what they did with books, with other products that they sold in that same business model where they actually were uh, selling and getting their money in before they actually received, had to pay for inventory, you know, because they were doing everything through the internet. They moved to a third party seller model um, that allowed third party sellers to work through their internet. They were uh, through their website. They got into Amazon Web Services. They got into developing the Kindle, which was a hardware product, totally different business model there. Then they got into the whole digital streaming world and including developing their own content with movies and other kinds of uh, other television related products in the content side. They continued to do that. Of course, you could get into the acquisition, an acquisition of a business model with Whole Foods. But other, th other than Amazon, as a rock star serial business model innovator, I can't really list one who continues to come up with new business models, either bought or developed. I mean, IBM did it in the day when it went from hardware to software to services. Netflix has done it, you know, going from its subscription DVD service to streaming and then its own content development. But in terms of the, the, just the vast number of shifts, that have required business model innovation, I think Amazon stands out on its own. Shifting to the dog corp concept that you talk about in chapter nine in your book, tell us what that is all about and what can companies do to avoid this mindset of the dog corp? So we used uh, dog corp as a fun little analogy about an existing uh, company, uh, a company that, if you will, uh, using this very liberally because I'm a dog owner, uh, makes dogs. And so they're very good at making dogs. They're very good at making different breeds of dogs. One day a manager comes in and offers up 
a new kind of breed called a, well, more than a breed, a new kind of animal called a cat. And it's just a way of showing that how the organization behaves when it's used to making dogs and all of a sudden a cat comes in, to, in is proposed in the organization. The first uh, sort of uh, rejection is to ignore it. And so companies all the time, Digital Equipment Corporation ignored personal computers. It wasn't that they fought against it per se, just in the beginning, they ignore, ignored the idea of personal computers and they didn't invest in it. So the first is you ignore the dog. The second is that you try to create what we say is a cat dog. They take in the cat, but then they try to shape it into something that looks more and more like a dog. And, um, and so you kind of have this strange little animal that's a cat dog. And companies do that all the time as well. Kodak, when it finally embraced digital imaging, um, decided to uh, take digital imaging and cram it into its existing film business paradigm by trying to create a digital camera that could compete against its film cameras. And the result of that was a $30,000 camera that nobody would buy, obviously, because it was so expensive. As opposed to saying, well, actually, there's something new we can do with digital, such as you know, it could enable uh, games um, in the early days. It could be something that could be on a handheld and wouldn't necessarily have the same kind of quality. So that's called cramming uh, or cat-dogging the existing business by leaving it within the mainstay instead of making out separate. And then the third is that you just feel it finally just try to kill it. Um, you know, you just decide to reject the uh, the new business business model because it's uh, taking too long. You know, resources are being taken away from what are perceived as the more important core resources, and so uh, everybody just sort of says this is a waste of time. We could shut down the project, and uh, so again, cat dog or cats and dogs is a way of trying to explain that really anything that's a new business model is going to oftentimes be killed for various reasons because the power of the existing business model is so strong um, and so managers, executives have to really understand how to preserve the core business model but at the same time create new business models by creating separateness and by being sponsors to shepherd resource allocation to enable those new business models to thrive while the core business model still exists and continues to do what it needs to do. Some advice to organizations, companies, what should they be aware of leveraging in order to have the, the, the most effective business model and also to continually transform their wide space? Is there two or three things in their arsenal sure. they should be Well, first aware of all, um, you know, there's a French poet, Paul Valéry, whose quote I think is very apt. He said that the future is not what it used to be. So every company faces a, a world at which knowledge and information is happening, is, is, moves faster than ever, technology develops at a much faster pace. I know we've always said, you know, change happens faster than ever, and that sounds cliche, but it's really true. And because of that, the first advice I would give a company is to be able to look not just out two years, but to look out five years or seven years and really try to understand where are things going in the long run, to have a long-term perspective and understand with that long-term pr perspective what can my core business, my core business model really deliver and what can it deliver. Because if we can understand what the real gap is about, we'll probably be much more motivated and much more committed to trying to create these new white space initiatives to be able to fill the gap and to have the patience to see them through and to be willing to create the structure so we don't have a cat-dog problem. That, that would be the number one bit of advice. The second would be to really develop a common language and a common way to think about business models and business model innovation. And that's what I try to do in the, in the book, Reinvent Your Business Model, is if nothing else, give a common language. Because without a language, if we just throw around we need a new business model or that's a different business model, we really don't understand what it is, we can't really manage it. So we need to get behind it in terms of the language and understand the pieces that make up a business model, and then we'd be able to have better ability to manage it. Thank you so much for talking with us today, Mark. Thank you very much.
And that's it for this edition of Sarder TV. We hope you enjoyed and learned something new today. Until next time, I'm Tracy Fitzpatrick. Thanks for watching.